As one of the last major Wii U games, Star Fox Zero emphasizes heavily on the gamepad second screen at a time where most developers, Nintendo included, actually seem to stop even thinking about the unique features a different monitor can provide, where most games benefit from this by displaying a map or other subsidiary information that usually would interrupt the gameplay due to opening up a menu, Star Fox Zero pictures an alternative, up-close perspective to the actions shown on TV. Targeting enemies is now based on motion controls instead of shooting always in front of the R-wing, therefore allowing players to maneuver around obstacles while assaulting in a completely different direction. Where once the radical and R-wing functioned as one unit bound to elements flying before them, the split to two fully distinct mechanics make them to separate gameplay elements that now require attention independently. It's easier to consider the gamepad as a playable radical that tries to be the main focus when shooting enemies. This is reinforced by the, to be a little exaggerated, imprecise radical shown on television. Shooting on TV does not translate well in reality as it's shown when looking into the gamepad which indirectly forces the player to switch focus consistently. Everyone knows the habit of leaning into a direction while controlling some kind of steering wheel. It's the first mannerism a driving instructor attempts to work on. Star Fox Zero faces the opposite quote -unquote, problem by creating a natural disconnect between both perspectives that needs training. Looking around with the gamepad creates the feeling of movement so we naturally assume that the R-Wing performs some kind of motion as well. But instead Instead it stays the same, which can be disorientated in fast-paced games like these. No other level than Sector Omega shows this more than clear, with the overall increased speed during the main part of the mission that actively encourages the player to keep his eyes from the gamepad. This is not to say that Star Fox Zero's controls don't function or make no sense, far from it. Their potential is best shown during all range mode, where it's no longer necessary to turn awkwardly around every time the enemy is out of sight. The new lock-on feature accomplishes this by keeping foes on track while creating a certain cinematic feeling to the main actions. Once again, the controls might require some familiarization, but the player can now concentrate solely on the gamepad, because the R-Wing tends to fly around the targeted object without crashing into obstacles. Boss fights benefit from this the most, which is also the reason why they take place in open fielded areas with no clear boundaries. The gorilla fight especially mirrors the first Corneria mission in terms of difficulty well by shifting the boss fight from the safe, open-ended air to the much more dangerous ground where players have to consider the surroundings in addition to the opponent. That being said, after spending a reasonable amount of time with the controls and getting accustomed to switching perspectives regularly, Star Fox never felt more flexible to me, which cannot be said for many other players. Practice appears to be the key, however the game gives itself not enough time to convey the gamepad's merits, in other words, it's too short. By the time most players have finished the base game with all the missions, they hardly got a grip of the controls, if at all. It might not be necessary to move the gamepad around like a camera, as it is often excessively shown in commercial but the motion controls still don't function as elegantly as for example playing the first Splatoon, because the right stick is not geared up to assist the motion controls naturally. Displacing most of the Arming's movement abilities, like the iconic barrel roll, to one single input device appears to be a logical conclusion, but the reality portrays a different perspective. Flicking the control stick to perform a barrel roll is not as intuitive as pressing a button, especially when multiple actions are triggered at the same time. Optional button layouts, something that even the very first Star Fox game provided, would bypass this problem, but even with the given possibility to restrict the motion controls to some degree, it's not enough. Prior to its release, ARMS found itself in a familiar situation by Nintendo marketing the new franchise as a fighting game based on motion controls, with the main difference of offering a traditional button layout, which led many players buying the game. It's not about the simple implementation of motion controls, it's how they are forced on the player without giving options to choose a traditional style. With some twerking, Star Fox Zero's controls would have easily functioned without a second screen, which is probably the reason why there's no proper battle mode. Obviously, additional players could just use Wii remotes, but this would give the player on the game a fundamental advantage because of the 180 degree view and emphasize the redundancy of a second screen. Besides, it's inexcusable to miss the chance of allowing to play the Wolfen's equivalent to the Walker, at least in some sort of form since it's probably the coolest idea in the whole game. 
Instead of focusing so much on switching perspectives regularly, the developers should have concentrated more on unique scenarios that cannot be played without a second screen. The gyro wing is a fine concept on paper and probably fits the game's control style the best, but can be trivialized by just pressing minus the second the direct eye touches the ground. Connecting the little robot to a rope that constrains its movement radius to a short distance was probably the biggest stumble the game could take in regard to potential. Going by the already given premise of sneaking into the enemy's base, a split-screen setup where both perspectives need attention at the same time would have worked perfectly due to the calm nature of the mission. Game and Wario used a similar style with one minigame and let the player perform the main task with the gamepad while applying tension on the TV. Directing the direct eye freely while dodging the guardian's light slowly with the gyro wing would be the same idea that could lead to something even greater. As it is now, there is no reason to look up to the TV at some occasions, even though the game trains the player to do that frequently. During the final phase of the Andros fight, the R wing flies towards the opposite direction, showing only the background while presenting completely different but irrelevant information on the gamepad. Once again, the situation would perfectly benefit from another context where players could see the R wing's angle of view in the gamepad, dodging asteroids while throwing off some chasers on TV. It's not about the usage of the gameplay, it's how they did not utilize it to its full extent. Even though the controls do provide a rewarding learning curve that slowly reveals its merits, it seemed like no one took really care, which is a problem way deeper rooted as it might appear. Up to this point, Nintendo had roughly three years to unveil and establish the gamepad as a concept, but not only did they fail, they also never acquainted to it themselves. Releasing Nintendo Land or Game and Wario in the early cycle does not primarily serve the purpose of showing off what the console is capable of, it also trains people for future titles. Neither did Mario 3D World nor Mario Kart 8 or any other noteworthy flagship title utilize the gamepad beside minor tricks, which ultimately led to the undeserved reputation of a gimmicky afterthought. It's easy to wish for additional ideas, but the whole situation is all the more unlucky considering how the game takes inspiration by a predecessor that, in hindsight, seems to just have waited for a controller like the gamepad. Following back to the roots of Star Fox Zero, it's inevitable to take a look at Star Fox 2, released on the SNES 2017. Basic reassemblances like enemy designs or core features aside, the sequel sets out to something much more ambitious in contrast to its predecessor. Rather than following a straight path with optional outcomes, the game takes place at a real-time battlefield where every action happens independently from the player's decisions. With the goal of protecting Corneria, a basic map illustrates the current situation even during operations and warns the player if enemy forces draw near. Despite the possibility to leave a mission at any time or catch up on the circumstances of the battlefield, once the player decides to infiltrate a base or mothership, it's unlikely he will take the actions outside of his actual battle into account, which is hardly a blame on the game's side considering its age and first attempt on such a rather involved premise. It's almost like the sequel would benefit strongly from some kind of secondary display device that provide information without stopping the events. The player could even send out crew members, like the partner of Star Fox 2, to handle multiple tasks at the same time, giving the game a strategic aspect that isn't seen in the franchise before. The levels themselves might be on the shorter side, but the overall drive to innovation and fresh concepts, which could not show their true potential because of the limited hardware, is probably the biggest achievement Star Fox 2 accomplished. Using a similar overall structure again that benefits from modern hardware might be a tempting idea, but they probably didn't want to use the same scenario again. Not all ideas belong to the past though, as the walker makes an understandable return in the form of a chicken leg machine. In comparison to the R-Wing, the walker functions much better with the given control scheme since it doesn't move automatically ahead and gives the players the time he needs to look around. Where the original version auto-aims at targets near its range, the new walker has to point at enemies manually and therefore needs more skill. The lock-on feature once again facilitates confrontations without taking too much from the experience away and eludes the problem of turning the camera awkwardly around while shooting like in Star Fox 2. Considering the much appreciated auto turn, the walker now mirrors the flexible option to the R-Wing it was always supposed to be and demonstrates how concepts from over 20 years ago might show their true capabilities with modern hardware. 
This is probably also the reason why the Landmaster gets only one dedicated level for itself, since the walker fulfills an almost identical role but could not supersede such an iconic Star Fox vehicle. Instead, the tank appears as a brief intermission in the frozen planet with an update that lets itself fly briefly for a short amount of time. Regarding the clever contrast of adapting the Arwing and Landmaster both to their initial weaknesses, it shows how increased flexibility, be it in the controls or outcome of a mission, is clearly one of the main goals of the game. Game. There may be less level than expected, but the overall freedom of choice in taking actions during each one makes up the lag and underlines the priority for flexibility. Boss fights evidence this by letting the player decide how they want to tackle a fight, with the first one opening holes to either let the walker in or destroy simply its cannons, or the attack carrier with its connection parts that are harder to hit but vulnerable at any time. It is a little disappointing to only see mechanical enemies instead of at least one organic one, but it was probably easier to act and weak points by showing glowing parts that match the mechanical beats more naturally. There's almost always more than one solution to a problem, which fits the overall replayability the series is known for. Missions especially improved heavily by this approach and changed the circumstances of the situation in best cases consistently. One of the finest examples is Sector Beta, which starts with a simple dogfight between the Cornerian and Andros forces, goes over to dismantling a giant ship and ends with a confrontation accompanied by Star Wolf. Little ups and downs like the enemy's shield that seems to be unbreakable give the sequence an arc of tension and portray a believable war with Andrew's forces. Even General Pepper takes finally part in the actions and commands fleets like they actually always were supposed to do, not to mention the appearance of several side characters. In fact, even dialogue differs on how fast a task is completed and adjusts to the player's pace, which is accomplished by portraying a cutscene on TV while being able to still play on the gamepad. Staged scenarios like these risk the danger of getting boring and occasional playthroughs, but allowing to basically skip them with the proper knowledge make terrific missions like these replayable any time. Knowing that the cannon will shoot instantly allows players to skip right through the shield, there is no need to create artificial surprise again. Area 3 follows the same path by concentrating on three different gameplay scenarios that differentiate each other by completely dissimilar playstyles. There's the expectable dogfight at the beginning, a whole underground construct dedicated to the walker and finally a short introduction to the gyro wing. As diversified as this may sound, there's still the option to skip right through the ending, which again emphasizes the still esteemed value of replayability. Unfortunately, not all missions can maintain this quality and fall back into old, uninventful patterns like simply destroying some rockets. Strictly speaking, there's no fault for more straightforward, shorter tasks considering the plain but secret side missions which aren't part of the main game and only enhance the scope. However, there should be at least one special feature to each main mission to keep them fresh. This is also the reason why the ice planet doesn't max out its fuel's potential as well, despite the amazing boss fight. Normally it's come to expect that the scenery is involved in some kind to the corresponding events, as it is even seen in older titles. Heat damaging the Arwing's health, sand that pulls the Landmaster in or primordial plants that sprawl out of the woodwork. Since it was always Nintendo's strive to give the franchise an exciting moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, there's no reason to hold back on the creativity of any mission given the already short length and by extension minor opportunity to impress the player. What makes missions like Area 3 or Sector Beta so memorable is for instance the suspenseful presentation the events take place. Participating in a dogfight with all the enemies and self-contained battles in the background never felt so believable. Even the Great Fox is part of some instances and helps to defeat a powerful foe. In contrast, battling against the attack carrier in an empty place represents the polar opposite and really shows how different a fight can feel without all the other units, which lets enemies appear grander than usual and has a special atmosphere to its own. A company that isn't usually known for going with modern trends like dealing with voice acting tried the very same thing over 20 years ago and offered full-on voiced characters in Star Fox 64. It often seems like that Nintendo, whatever the motive may be, doesn't apt to go with trends when the real reason is the consideration if a series benefits in some kind of the selected design choice. Orchestral compositions aren't very Mario-like, but they fit the galaxy setting like the overall lower difficulty makes sense for the Wind Waker's vibrant tone. 
Of course there are exceptions, but Star Fox Zero soundtrack follows the same idea and emphasizes much more on a grandiose feeling that shows itself most notably with rearrangements of, at this point, iconic compositions. The eye for details doesn't stop here, as characters are just as cheesy as it's expected from a Star Fox game, with Peppy for example waiting impatiently for Sleepy's shield analysis. Normally I'm not the biggest fan of portraying a boss fight's energy with a simple life bar, since it's much more appealing to do so in a visual sense in battle, but having the enemy stamina displayed in a cockpit of a highly modern spaceship is at least logical, especially due to the appreciated contextualization of Sleepy's ability to do so. Star Fox 64 played with this by excluding including him from the actions for one occasion, leaving the boss vitality for a part of the battle shrouded in mystery, but Zero makes up for this by enhancing the teammates helpfulness and overall intelligence. This is not the only case where the predecessor surpasses the follow up even by a hair's breadth. The devil is in the detail, which is why it's little underwhelming that the R-Wing only shows some signs of usage after getting hit several times, but doesn't lose a wing and plays noticeably different like in Star Fox 64. Seemingly minor details like these can have a clear effect on the gameplay's feel, since a character or vehicle should get weaker the more damage is sustained. All too often bosses power up the more health they lose, which makes sense from a design perspective for the simple reason of keeping the fight exciting, but just doesn't add up narratively because the same idea should play to the adversary. Zero's bosses cross a fitting middle line and let players destroy parts of the arsenal without diminishing their life energy, which again adds to the freedom of approaching a fight. Even without the bonus of weakening the opponent, destroying as many ships, objects or body parts adds to the high score at the end of each mission. Keeping allies alive naturally contributes to the score, but the player's actions are a linchpin when it comes to performing well. Just taking out enemies isn't enough though, as it becomes obvious that something clearly needs to be taken into account to reach a proper score. Most ships get into a plummet after being shot down, so destroying them before they crash into an obstacle grants bonus points that will make a difference. The same goes for the charge shot, composed of two different variations depending on the promptness the projectile is shot after being charged fully. What makes little things like these so great is not just the grafting to refine the overall gameplay, it's the subtlety that does not need explanation and can be found by the player himself instead of revealing every trick. Of course basic maneuver are naturally demonstrated within the missions, like Sector Alpha bombards the player with exceptional numerous projectiles so to train the barrel roll. The reason behind the pleasant access to the game without being tortured by tutorials is the clever split of a separate training mode that teaches the fundamentals and can luckily be ignored completely, although there is a neat extra vehicle that feels like a testing object led by the developers. Likewise, amiibo figures are fortunately just as avoidable because of the vague value surrounding them. Whatever you might think of features hiding behind figures that needs to be purchased separately, there's no denying that the more years go past, the harder it becomes to get them, especially if it applies to lesser known ones like Falco. The consequences are lost features which let some Wii U games age poorly because at some point there will be no possibility to experience all these facets of some games. With the simple solution of providing both amiibo rewards, Star Fox Zero easily dodges this problem and offers a nice price for completing the game. While the Dark R-Wing simply lives by the risk versus reward principle, the retro vehicle isn't only a skin swap but changes the music at the Corneria stage and alters the charge shot's property, therefore offering much more than a simple reskin. As enjoyable as these rewards may sound, it's especially because of their freshness, which is why restraining them from the arcade mode is all the more sad. After completing the game 100%, there isn't much motivation to play the game regularly again, besides raising the high score which cannot be shared at least in an online ranking, thereby each skin depraves to a one-time checkout despite the replayability potential they bring along. The same goes for additional playable characters with different R-Wing types. There is one single mission in Zero where the player takes on the role of Peppy and destroys a huge ship all alone. Although the scenario of David vs Goliath reflects his character as a seasoned veteran well, it shows how the character in the R-Wing was never the franchise's priority in the first place. After all, if the opening didn't explicitly mention Peppy taking the charge, the player would have no idea the characters changed because the R-Wing feels and looks the same. There were great attempts on visualizing each character 
character a little more with the unique designs that represented their relative title clearly, with the addition of special abilities and even some different attributes, as it is seen in Star Fox Command and even Star Fox 2 again. This would help tremendously to distinguish each member from each other, but the overall result would be the same. People think they play as Fox McCloud, Slippy, Peppy or Falco, when in reality they play as the R-Wing, Gyro-Wing, Landmaster or Walker and sometimes even a simple camera. Star Fox Guard released alongside Zero and picks up one of Miyamoto's prototypes shown during a time where it wasn't clear this concept would become a Star Fox game in the first place. Unlike other titles of the series, Guard builds on a tower defense system that once again leans heavily on the gamepad and lets players fill the role with cameras. By placing a handful of security cameras on the second screen, a mob of robotic enemies has to be eliminated before they reach the base's core. While the basic map design is predetermined, the choice of each camera spot is up to the player and can even be changed during the defense phase. To some extent, the outcome of a mission should therefore be bound to the preparation done before and but by allowing to switch up positions, players can basically adapt to any situation. Despite the great dynamic this flexibility provides, there should have been at least a few missions without the luxury just to increase the challenge. It's too easy to switch up on the fly, which is why different enemy types determine the difficulty of each mission. With two types, Chaos Class and Combat Class, the variety is honestly more than adequate, especially because of the special behavior pattern. There are enemies that jump or crawl over walls, become invisible, pick up cameras and carry them along, disrupt radio signals or assault from the sky. Even with the main objective of keeping the gameplay diverse, they accomplish much more. Players will place cameras most likely at each entrance since it's natural to expect enemies invading there. By spreading the danger into all directions, players have to consistently look around and keep an eye on basically all directions, which prevents predictability in most cases. After all, there is no chance to change a camera's viewpoint without controlling them, so playing one monitor to an edge looking in the sky might seem wasted but only proves experienced guards. The biggest sample most people probably even don't think of initially is alongside the position of the camera a proper viewpoint. Positioning a device at the corner makes no sense when they stay at a wall, so leaving them in the right angle is something experience will bring along. This is probably the biggest achievement the spin-off gets right, the difference in behavior during the beginning and ending of the game. Naturally, there is no possibility to watch previous attempts, but the disparity from placing cameras on absolute obvious places versus more strategic positions is something noteworthy. It's not about getting better, but rather turning smarter based on knowledge. In the end, the act of shooting or aiming requires no skill, as different camera types trigger varied effects but operate identical. The time stop ability allows to stop last ditch attempts towards the core, while a flying device secures an overview on the whole structure. The helpful after effects speak for themselves, but more importantly is the positioning that truly elevates their worth. The game gives the player all the tools to win, it just depends on the execution and therefore again the player's wits to handle the defense. From the very beginning it becomes explicit that this gameplay feels considerably more comfortable in using the gamepad since its all necessary information are once again displayed on TV whereas the gamepad serves as the main attraction during preparation and becomes a helping hand whilst defending. Contrary to Zero, Guard focuses always on one perspective primarily with the assistance of a second screen that provides separated information instead of displaying the same actions in a different light. Because of that, it feels very natural to switch perspectives since it's possible to handle one screen without the other. The reason behind this natural interaction is Guard being a standalone experience detached from predecessors that define the gameplay's essential direction. Therefore, it comes as no surprise that the overall concept of guiding a base with a gamepad works so sophisticated that it leaves the impression a complete different team and director constructed the gameplay. There are no motion controls because it's necessary to carefully put cameras on different spots, so moving the gamepad around while doing that would have been extremely awkward to perform. Same goes for the online component, which vanishes once the server's gone down but preserves the lifespan of the game according to circumstances. Even so, there will still be the option to create custom levels, so there will always be at least a little occasion to start a few rounds. 
They might not be a local multiplayer, but I always appreciate it if games accomplish to create a passive multiplayer where basically only one player is required and the second one can participate by watching without influencing the game directly. Again, Game and Wario did something similar with one game, but in the case of Guard, spectators can keep an eye on all the cameras and therefore help the player on the gamepad to handle multiple devices. It's from here where minor but clever details maybe become more apparent. Enemies react to being spot and consequently try to hurry up or the laggy displaying of unused cameras. Even the music serves as a secondary assistant and becomes more frantic as the robots draw closer to the goal and start their last wave. Although this helps to pay more attention, it hinders the ability to think clearly at the same time due to the panic state of the sequence, which is why defeats are unavoidable. Recordings of the failing help to gather information and are worthwhile just to see how enemies manage to sneak in completely unobtrusive. This helps to judge which type of enemy really live up to their reputation, as many players most certainly know the danger of the FLI unit and its ability to end a mission in a second. Beside this rather unusual exception to an unbalanced enemy, it's often the combination of effects that shine in teamwork. Chaos classes basically don't attack the core on their own, so they open the way for combat classes which normally are pretty vulnerable without support. It's not only the basic types who know how to shuffle their cards though, as boss fights can, in spite of their massive presence, lean heavily on the support of chaos classes. At first I found the occlusion of more traditional boss fights a little strange because they don't fit in the strategic aspect of the game and end up being a little fugacious, but I guess no one dismisses more action focused rarely occurring exceptions that prove the overall confident rules. As time flew past, it isn't hard to notice how Star Fox shifted its focus from technological masterpieces to experimental risk-taker. Gone are the days where each subsequent installment crosses their respective hardware limitations in order to create absorbing universes that not only look and sound better, but derive a benefit from this progress by adjusting the gameplay to its required preconditions. While surely sounding like a noble goal, it might be difficult to reconsider this strive for advancement as a basement for ideas with the trait of being ahead for their time. One have to look no further than Star Fox Guard's premise, which started as a unique tower defense game without a face, wrapped up by a nice Star Fox facade. Although the technological side doesn't impress from a visual standpoint, hardware limitations don't only apply to the look or graphics of a game. Without the second screen, the developers could have never realized Guard's well-implemented concept to this extent and would have never gotten the chance again, since Nintendo's hardware progresses but changes architecturally at the same time. Now, Star Fox Zero seemed to toddle between power and innovation without delivering on either side. Despite the rewarding learning curve the admittedly unusual but working controls provide, there's something to be desired in terms of potential. At its best, the gamepad coexists with the actions displayed on TV and shows moments that otherwise wouldn't work with the traditional control scheme. But at its worst, the second perspective feels like an actual mere option that cannot be changed in a desperately needed option menu. Consequently, the core idea drains from its hardware as a result of processing the gameplay twice instead of exploiting its power to fulfill a vision like it used to be. As underwhelming as this may sound, glimmer of lights twinkle through the galaxy as both mission structures and boss fights benefit greatly from dynamic approaches through the reuse power and deliver more exciting stage moments than ever before. It's actually quite interesting how Star Fox Zero's biggest achievement is the gap between great and needlessly weak, with the prior one gaining the upper hand if seen through a second perspective. In all their focus of selling the game as a reinterpretation of an already exhausted premise, it seems like they lost the bigger picture of a sadly struggling but stylish franchise, when all they should have done was to give players finally a long overdue reason to simply board an R-Wing and do some barrel rolls again.